Well, thank you for attending uh, today. In today's presentation, I'm going to be giving you a street view of 10 appellate court decisions and some new legislation that I think will be useful for all of us as we're practicing family law in 2023. The decisions we'll be discussing today have a heavy concentration on probate and family law crossover issues, as well as many cases regarding the validity of marital agreements. Before we get into that, let's start off with your favorite topic, attorney's fees. And we have two decisions to review, and the first one is on slide three, and we're talking about marriage of Knox. And in this case, marriage of Knox, we'll be learning about what is required of a family law court and when a family court has discretion, when it doesn't, when there's a request for pendente lighty fees. So in June of 2005, the parties get married. Uh, in June of 2018, the wife files for dissolution of marriage. And in May of 2018, wife files an RFO for temporary spousal support, pendente lighty attorney's fees, and the sale of the family residence. The hearing for the wife's request for penente lighty fees is initially set for June of 2018, but the parties stipulate to several continuances, all of them which were due to the unavailability of the husband's attorney. So he was represented from beginning to end by a, a local uh, attorney. She had several attorneys. Um, and the reason why is, is that, quite frankly, she couldn't afford them and they kept, kept leaving, leaving her. Wife's request for penente lighty attorney's fees remains pending throughout the dissolution action and is not heard until after the trial. And the reason why is, is, as it was getting late in the game, the court says, why don't we just put this over this issue at the end of the trial rather than deciding now. In May of 2019, a three-day trial begins. And again, in this case, the wife is in pro per while the husband is represented by local counsel. And you can kind of figure out how this is going to go. One issue at trial involves the characterization of community interest in the family residence. And such resolution requires the trial court to determine whether the party's first home after the marriage had been transmuted from the husband's separate property to the wife's community property. Now, the testimony was that on December of 2006, the husband uh, recorded a grant deed that stated that husband as a single man granted the property in question to husband and wife as joint tenants. So the wife, again, she's litigating this, trying to do her the best she can, and she thinks she's got them on the ropes, uh, but she does not mark the deed as a trial exhibit and does not offer it into evidence at the time during the trial. And what happens? Well, the trial court awards husband the marital residence and determines 88% of the value of the home is his separate property and the remaining 12% is community property. The trial court finds that since the grant deed was not admitted into evidence, and we all know that 852 of the Family Code provides that transmutation cannot occur without a written, unambiguous expression of intent to transfer the interest, the court says, sorry, you haven't met your burden, so I'm going to find that this is his separate property. And of course, uh, with regard to the other issues, the wife doesn't fare well either. Turning to the issue of spousal support and attorney's fees, the trial court awards the wife a paltry, and remember, this is a 13-year marriage, and there's a big disparity of incomes, uh, 12 months of spousal support, and there's a step-down order. The first uh, six months, $1,000 per month, and the final, $550 a month. With regard to attorney's fees, the trial court also denies the wife's request for fees. After all, she didn't submit a Keech declaration. She didn't go and get declarations from her prior attorneys and submit them as evidence. So she's not very happy. She appeals, and fortunately for her, the court, the trial court is reversed. So the Court of Appeal first addresses the duties of a family court when it's rendering this decision. And the court says simply, let's look at the code, because the code has all the answers. 2030, if you look at it closely, a, subsection A2 tells us that the court, the trial court shall make findings. It doesn't say it doesn't have discretion. And it also says that that old law where the trial court has great discretion in ordering fees, well, that's not true anymore. And uh, the, the court puts an end to that little discussion. The court then addresses how quickly a family court must hear pendente lighty attorney's fees. And what it says is, well, let's look at the code again. The code says that uh, the family court shall rule on the request within 15 days of the hearing. And uh, 
the court says, in other words, a family court that does not resolve a request for penente lighty fees until after trial has not ensured a self-represented party's access to legal representation. And one word that popped up in this decision that I think that you should be aware of is the term, it's actually a term, reasonable promptness. It's not in the code, but this appellate court decision talks about a court's duty to be reasonably prompt with regard to the issuance of attorney's fees. So what did I learn about this case? Well, first of all, I can't tell you how many times I've had this problem. In fact, I currently have a domestic violence case where we prevailed in the fall of 2021 and we're still pending attorney's fees for prevailing party statutes. Uh, so I think that this is a case that we all collectively need to cite at every attempt to obtain fees for our clients. I think we need to educate the courts as to their duties because a lot of them still think they have the discretion and if we all cite this case, we're likely to get somewhere. The first crossover decision that we're gonna talk about, like I said, there's a lot of these decisions that we're gonna talk about today and this is one of those crossover issues with probate and family court. So. They're, fight, they're fighting over the fact that the husband claims the brother is concealing a portion of his inheritance. In 2006, husband and siblings, and this is again while the husband is still married to wife, uh, meet and reach an agreement. Husband documents on a two-page handwritten memorandum that's written mostly in Chinese, uh, uh, an agreement. The handwritten agreement provides, among other things, that the husband is to be paid $4 million. Now, several months afterwards, the siblings execute what they call a formal compromise agreement for structured settlement, a compromise agreement, we'll call it, which contains many of the terms of the handwritten agreement, but does not mention the $4 million. Husband is to receive inter alia about $100,000 in exchange for giving up his interest in various companies. And he's got a lot of other things he's gonna get as well. In 2011, wife files for dissolution of marriage and her interests are parallel with the husband's because of the fact that shortly after they got married, he signed a transmutation agreement. And I don't know why he would do that, but he did. And so you have husband and wife going through a divorce, fighting husband's uh, two siblings. The siblings and several businesses they own together are involuntarily joined into the dissolution proceedings on the grounds that they were holding community property. So again, this is a interesting case because we're dealing with kind of like probate issues, but we're in family court where we're dealing with, with the rights of property. There's a long cause trial. Now the court had estimated that it was only gonna be three days and the parties didn't object to that. But as we will find out, this, this trial lasted seven days. And during the trial, the parties dispute whether a handwritten agreement was meant to be a standalone contract or a memorandum of general points to be later incorporated into a formal contract. The spouses, of course, claimed that he was never paid $4 million, which would be a community asset, and that the money was still owed to him under the handwritten agreement, while the siblings are saying, hey, that wasn't a binding contract. That was just you know, a memorandum of general points. And this is the important part of this decision, is during the trial, the husband hesitates to stipulate to the authenticity of documents with medallions, questioning whether the medallions were out of his possession. You know what I'm talking about, medallions? That's the, uh, you know, that's the type where they're the old fashioned signatures. Well, they were using those here. And he's questioning, you know, I, I think I might've lost it. I don't, that wasn't my medallion. You know, he was, he, he was really raising issues at trial and had the other side have to fight for authenticating that it actually was his. After five days of trial, the husband concedes that documents were signed by him. Uh, husband also questions the accuracy of several translated documents, which requires an appearance by a translator. And what's important about this is that the parties had stipulated to the use of that particular translator prior to the trial, but after a lengthy cross-examination, husband reluct reluctantly stipulates the authenticity of the translations. Trial court finds in favor of the claimants, claiming that the compromise agreement was an enforceable contract, but the handwritten agreement was not. The trial court notes in its opinion, this was not even a close judicial call, and finds that husband's testimony was misleading, not credible, and is even false at times. After the trial court issues the tentative ruling, husband uh, requests an additional $50,000 for attorney's fees incurred during the trial plus $30,000 for appeal. And what you should know is, is that he had already been awarded a bunch of attorney's fees, him and his wife, throughout the proceedings, but at the end, he's saying, I want more. The additional four-day trial was wholly unnecessary, according to the court. 
The trial court denies the request finding that the husband over litigated the case and failed to show reasonable grounds on appeal. Husband appeals and, sorry for him, the decision is affirmed. In rendering the decision, the Court of Appeal reminds us of the purpose of 2030 of the Family Code. And it states that it's not about the redis redistribution of money, it's the purpose is parity, a fair hearing, a fair hearing with two sides equally represented. Next, the court recited marriage of Sharples and its discussion of how trial tactics are considered in the analysis. In addition to the party's financial resources, the court may consider the party's trial tactics. The court should limit and award of fees that were reasonably necessary, including by taking into account over litigation. Services which have no apparent effect other than to prolong or complicate domestic litigation cannot be deemed reasonably necessary. Does that sound like language you want to use in your briefs? I know it's something that I want. Next, the court looked at the facts of the case to determine if the husband's trial taxes were reasonable. And, you know, the, one of the quotes that I pulled out for you is, Daniel, the husband, objected to each medallion guaranteed exhibit, many of which contained his wet signature. <laughs> and then after five days of trial, Daniel's counsel finally represented, I confirmed that each of the documents were signed, that they were signed by Daniel by him, and his medallion was used by him and his permission. You know, just over litigation. So in summary of this case, have you ever had a case like this? Have you ever had a case where somebody won't let go or they're over litigating? You know, they're just uh, being silly and racking up fees. This is a great case to cite when the opposing side, without a doubt, is over litigating uh, or when they're misleading or giving false testimony. The judge must have felt that the husband was trying to fool him because this is different than litigating an issue and simply losing, right? You could lose, you could, you could advocate for your client, but the attorney in this case, remember, there was an attorney on this side. It isn't really about the husband, it's about the attorney. How does this reflect on the attorney's trial tactics? Trial Advocacy 101 tells us not to fight the inevitable and maintain your credibility with the court. Because you start looking like a bozo in front of the judge with these stupid issues like this, they start tuning you out, right? And I think a lot of times what we're fighting for is the credibility, our own credibility as much as our clients. Okay, now we're gonna change topics and we're gonna change to the issue of child custody. Now, there weren't a lot of uh, custody cases, but I'm going to talk about one in particular that I think is worthy, and this could be Ramsden versus Peterson on slide 26. And this deals with what constitutes a change of circumstances. What is it that we're talking about? Slide 27, mothers and father have one child together. In 2016, mom seeks an order to allow her to move to Arkansas with a child who is only four years old. Now, right from the get-go, we know she's going to lose. Who in the right mind would move to Arkansas from the state of California, right? Where they eat corn and do other things that we're not familiar with, right? Well, the trial court smartly denies the request but grants her primary physical custody. In 2017, mom files a second request to move out of the state with the child, this time to Oklahoma, where mom's new husband is stationed. Now, I don't know if anybody is familiar with Oklahoma or, or uh, Fort Sills, Oklahoma, but there's only two things that come out of Oklahoma. And I'll refer you to Officer and a Gentleman for that quote because it's not appropriate here. <laughs> Trial court again denies mom's request. Mom again chooses to remain in California. So hu husband is out serving the military. She's here in California. Now, in May of 2020, something significant happens. Mom receives a telephone call. And the telephone call is from the father's girlfriend. And the girlfriend says that father has assaulted her in front of the child. The child is now afraid of father and wants mom to pick her up. And the child is also afraid that of father because father had recently driven while intoxicated while the child was in the car and hit a parked car. So mom files an emergency request for exclusive custody. And I was surprised by this decision that the court didn't grant that. It kept things status quo initially with that information. However, uh, the, there is a proceeding with regard to modification of custody, and during this time, mom and father stipulate to the appointment of minors counsel. The parties further agreed that minors counsel should review the child welfare services plan and come back with a recommendation. And, by the way, the parties stipulated that the court could take into evidence the entire file, the case file, which is kind of risky, depending on who you are. 
Incidentally, in this case, the husband tried to take that back, and the court said, sorry, you already stipulated. At a subsequent hearing, the minor's counsel argues that the child loves the father dearly but does not feel comfortable going into his residence during the weekend or during the week. And she recommends that the trial court adjust custody so that the father will have child on alternating week ends. Now, father does not object to this interim order so that the child could get stabilized again. So there's a stipulation that he will now have alternate weekends. And what do you think that mom does at this time? She makes her third request to move out of the state of California, but this time she's smart because she asked the court to move to the great state of Illinois, <laughs> which is where I'm from. And they stipulate that, uh, again, the entire file is coming into evidence, the ch and that includes the uh, DCFS report, by the way. Well, the trial court grants mom's request to move to uh, Illinois with the child, and it states that, you know, I, I didn't place much weight on the May 2020 incident. That phone call that you got from the girlfriend, I, su I suspect maybe the girlfriend didn't show up, and I don't know what happened there, but the court didn't put a lot of weight on that. But here's what the court says. So circumstances have changed sufficiently to permit granting mom's request. Mom's relationship with her husband had grown much stronger in contrast to father's relationship with his girlfriend. And mom's request is permitted either under the best interest of the child standard or the changed circumstance uh, standard. So interesting, saying, you know, this is what I'm basing this on, is this strengthening of the relationship versus the weakening of the relationship in the, very, in the two households. Father appeals, and this is what he argues on appeal. He says, the trial court erred when it permitted minors counsel to make custody and visitation recommendations. So it's that old argument that I've tried many times. It is, Your Honor, you know what? She's acting like she's a custody evaluator. She's up there making recommendations. Trial court erred when it permitted minors counsel to introduce hearsay evidence. And by the way, that's all hearsay. She can't talk about what the minor child said. The trial court applied the wrong standard when granting mom's request. You know what? Uh, this should have been uh, a different standard. It's not the best interest of the child standard. And the evidence was insufficient to support mom's request. Well, on appeal, the appellate court ticked off its answers to each argument that the husband had made or the father had made. So did the trial court err when it permitted counsel for the child to make custody and visitation recommendations? Well, the appellate court said, look, you, know, you guys stipulated to that. How could you object to it? And by the way, under the family code, they're allowed to do so, right? 3150 subsection A, they're allowed to do so. That's a silly argument. Did the trial court impermissibly allow minors counsel to act like a 730 expert? Uh, we reject these arguments because counsel did not testify as an expert. It was not called as a witness. And I thought that was interesting because I think this is kind of a a way for a trial court to get around allowing minors counsel to say whatever they want to say. Because you could say, look, she's just arguing, right? I'm not taking that as evidence. I'm going to rely on something else like the strength of the relationship, right? Did the trial court allow minors counsel to introduce hearsay? Well, it said, you know, but this contention presumes that counsel testified it. No, I don't think that they t it was testified. It was just argument. Uh, the move away was just a request, a presumption Ramson does not support with evidence or analysis. And by the way, in any event, the father was not shown that he was prejudiced by the testimony. I, I, we'll talk about that, but I think that we're, we're giving minors counsel a lot, of, a lot of leeway with this decision. Did the trial court allow the wrong standard concerning the move away request? The court below applied the proper standards in this decision. The court noted that uh, under, under both tests, best interest and change of circumstances, that uh, the court was right. So what do we learn from this case? Only in family law do we see this recurrent type of conduct where a girlfriend and former wife become friendly for a common purpose. <laughs> so keep your friends close, but your enemies closer, right? On a more serious note, this is a case that involves the issue of the role of minors counsel as much as anything. This is a minors counsel's case. Um, husband argues minors counsel was permitted to act like an expert without the benefit of being cross-examined. The Court of Appeal rejected that argument. The Court of Appeal also dismissed the argument that minors counsel was allowed hearsay testimony. It was just arguing. So if you're in court and you start hearing those objections, you could cite this case. We don't know from this opinion why her request was twice denied. Okay, she, she was asking to move out of the state. Okay, but we know why the third time surfaced, the third time she was allowed to move out of the state. And I want to challenge you to think about this. She was allowed to move out of the state because 
this, her relationship wasn't new anymore. That's what the trial court said. But the first couple of times it was new, but now there's a strength, the relationship is strengthened. Well, I question that, because isn't that a long-term relationship? I mean, she's married, but her husband's in Illinois, Oklahoma. The only reason why it's strengthened is because they're not living together, right? They don't have nothing to fight about. <laughs> the other thing is, is what happened to La Musée? I read this thing a couple of times, and I'm like, I don't see a, a reference at all to La Musée factors other than the bond between the two parents. There was nothing about the bond between the parent and the child or anything like that. So I, I don't know if it's because it wasn't argued on appeal or what, but it seemed odd that we're dealing with a move away case and there aren't a lot of safe factors. Finally, who's the heroine of this great novel? Okay, who was it? It's the girlfriend, of course, right? Right? It's doubtful that mom would have even made a request for move away the third time if it wasn't for that lovely lady that picked up the phone. So here's to the girlfriend. Okay, our next case, we're gonna talk about child support. It's gonna be on slide 37. We only really have one case for child support, but I think it's, it's an interesting one, nevertheless. Uh, slide 38, we're talking about Haley versus Antonovich. And specifically, we're dealing with a very curious case dealing with a work-seek order. Mother and father have a five-year-old child together. Initially, child spends 80% of the time with mother and 20% of the time with father. During this time, he's paying her $15.25 per month in child support. In February of 2020, the child's time with father increases to 42%, and of course, as a result, he files a motion to modify his child support order. Now, his income has increased. It's increased to $17,500 per month, and you know, he's truthful about that. He's saying, I'm still entitled to a downward modification because I've got more time with the child. Mother's income and expense declaration is the focus on this decision. Her income is $8,391 per month, and it includes father's reduced child support and a $7,500 monthly gift from her father. Reports monthly expenses under uh, income and expense declaration of 10,979, leaving a 2,588 shortfall. Father's declaration support of his RFO, he says, you know what? Uh, I not only want a modification of support, but I want you to make a seek work order. Order her to start going and, and applying for jobs and reporting back to the court. Mom's declaration says that the court does not increase father's child support. He, she says, guidelines are not even enough. I think it should be more because I've got this deficit. I want you to depart from the statewide guideline uh, because I'm not able to survive and to adequately care for our child unless you do so. And by the way, having, forcing me to interview for jobs or having a job would interfere with the child's attachment bond in personal care. And by the way, the child was, at the time of the appeal, was only five years old. We'll talk a little bit about that. He's pretty young, you know, in this case. Uh, he was attending uh, preschool at the time. Well, the trial court reduces the monthly child support to $891 per month, retroactive to February 2020, leaving mom owing him $4,438 in child support. And that's a significant factor, and I'll get around to that. But she, has, she owes him some money because of the overpayment. And the court issues a seek work order stating that the policy of the state of California is that both parents should work and provide support for the minor child. So I will issue the work seek order for, for mom to, find, so, uh, to find work and her skills and experience. So mom appeals and the decision is affirmed. In deciding this case, the court began with a discussion of the mother's need for more income. And basically it says, look, you know, she says uh, she established that her income was insufficient to adequately support the child. Well, that's why she needs to go back to work. You know, I mean, if, coming from her own lips, she's saying that she, there needs to be more effort. Um, her monthly gift income and modified child support totaled, you know, less than uh, what she says that she had. She had this huge shortfall. So why wouldn't we expect her to make reasonable efforts to find work? Courts noted that she had ability and opportunity to work. She had earned a bachelor's degree and previously been employed. In addition, there was evidence that between the increased child custody time, that she had more time to actually work, right? Because it was almost 50%, so she had a lot more time to work. And I'm citing this for you because if you wanted to look at the decision, there's some great arguments made that the Court of Appeal makes for us that we could use. Next to the court discussed the recurring gift issue, the marriage of Alter, of course, right? And Anovich also contends the trial court erred by failing to require evidence that her father's recurring gifts would continue if she was employed. 
And the court turned it back on her and said, you know what? Uh, abs absent evidence that that's going to happen, we're not going to assume that those gifts aren't coming forward. You've got to come back and show that your father stopped making those gifts. Would working be detrimental to the child? The court said there's no, no evidence of that. I don't see many cases where a work seek order is requested. I, in fact, I've never personally had one. I know there's uh, Lisa has had some, and maybe uh, Lee has probably had some. Jeanette, I've never had. Uh, I think that this decision could be persuasive with similar facts where there is a highly educated person with work experience who refuses to work. But let's look closely at 4505 of the Family Code. And I'll ask you, was this a stretch of the code? Because the code states that a court may require a parent who alleges that the parent's default in a child support family court order is due to the parent's unemployment to submit. In other words, there's got to be a default in a child or family support order. I think that this section was actually meant for the payer of support more than it was the, the receiver of support. And what the Court of Appeal said is that neither one of them objected to the court doing this. They actually stipulated a trial that the court had authority to do so. So is, it this, is this even a relevant case for you? Well, I think maybe what the trial court did is it made sure there was a rearages, right? And then said, well, you know what? You're in default, so I could order the, the seek work order. I'm not sure about that, but it seems like that. Uh, again, this is a good case to review if you're looking for persuasive language to quote regarding both parents' duty to support the children. Uh, you know, and again, the child was relatively young, probably about four years old. And you, most of us know that courts give the custodial parent a little leeway when children are young. But in this case, uh, she wasn't so lucky. OK. Let's turn topics to uh, slide 46, and we're talking about domestic violence. As has been consistent with every year for the past 10 years, there's a whole bunch of domestic violence cases. I've only plucked out one, as they're starting to be a little bit redundant. But this one here I thought was novel, and it would be good for us all to know. I'm talking about MS versus AS, and it's going to deal with protected parties. You know, that, That's the topic, really, is, is who could be named a protected party. Mother and father are married in this case. They have three children. Shortly after mother and father separate, mother seeks a domestic violence restraining order against father for herself and the children and requests child custody and visitation orders. Mother alleges that father enlisted her friends and her own mother to talk to her regarding reconciliation and threatened to kill her male friend and engage children to spy on the mother. Father files a response, denying it. He says, I, you know, I haven't harmed the children or physically harmed mom and argues that mom's allegation that he talked to the children about mom were insufficient to justify inclusion of the children in a DVRO. The hearing is held on mom's request for a permanent DVRO. Slide 50, mom's testimony. She says, look, father plays with children in exceptionally rough even when asked to stop. <laughs> on one occasion, father chokes out one of the children in public and father screams at the children, calls children derogatory names, and encourages them to engage in physical violence with each other for entertainment. Now, the child number one, the oldest child, comes into court and testifies. And this is the child's testimony. Father frequently insults me and my, and my siblings, belittles us, and screams at us. But under cross-examination, testifies that he fears for his safety after his mother and left father, but does not testify that father was physical with him. So he doesn't say, look, dad was ever physically abusive toward me. Father would enlist uh, him to spy on mom. And father had mom, had the child help locate the house of the man mom was seeing and told ch the child that he would physically harm the man and that he drove by the man's house and looked at him through a scope on a mounted rifle. That's called parenting. <laughs> Mother's father testified that on several occasions she witnessed the children's tears fighting back. So this is the mother's mother uh, testifying. And she's witnessed the children fighting back tears after father slapped them on the head while playing and that the child would freeze in fear and father would yell at them during family activities. Now, this is one of those guys, right? He's, he's, he's kind of the man of the house and he, you know, he does what he wants to do and kids are you know, kind of treated the way that you and I probably wouldn't treat our kids. Well, the trial court grants the restraining order, naming mom and the children as protected parties. Mom is granted temporary physical and legal custody with supervised visits for father. The trial court finds that the evidence presented by mother fell within the uh, Domestic Violence Protective Act. 
and states that father had occasionally engaged in acts of physical violence towards the children and engaged in a campaign of harassment against mom by enlisting the children to talk, to stalk her and gather information on her. Father appeals, and he says on appeal, he looks like, I'm not challenging the propriety of the restraining order as it pertains to mom, okay? But contends that the trial court abused its discretion by including the children as protected parties. Well, the appellate court started its analysis by noting that the trial court's general comments about the strength of the evidence that father committed domestic violence against the father. It quotes the court. The court acknowledged that MS did not present as much evidence as expected, but found that the evidence she did present fell within the, within the Domestic Violence Protective Act. Specifically, the court concluded AS had engaged in a campaign of harassment against mom shortly after the party separated by enlisting the children. That's a no-brainer, right? We've got a restraining order protecting mom, no-brainer. Next, the Court of Appeal noted the trial court's comments about father's abuse towards the children. The court found, and this is what they're saying, is the court found that AS occasionally engaged in acts of physical violence towards the children. The court stated that while the testimony established that this was most commonly occurring in the context of overly rough play, the children did not experience this conduct by their father as play. So the Court of Appeal is uh, agreeing with the trial court that it was appropriate to find that it was how the children are experiencing the play, not how the father intended it. The court tackled the issue of what standard is necessary for naming people as protected parties. And I really love this because I didn't know. I never looked at the code close enough. Shame on me. And the, and the court looked at 6320 subsection A and said it requires only good cause. You do not have to show that the children were victims of domestic violence. You don't have to show grandma was or anybody that's living in, you know, in that house and stuff. You just have, have to have good cause. So it's a much lower standard than a lot of us uh, used to think about. Having considered the law as it applied to the protected parties, the court held there was substantial evidence to support the trial court's ruling. This case covers new ground with respect to the domestic violence restraining order cases. We know from this decision that a court can name children as protected parties when there is evidence a parent elicited the children in the act of a DV. That's, that's not a, a difficult one, but some courts might, uh, might not know that. Also, the Court of Appeal gave the nod to when a parent plays harshly with a child, it can be one of the reasons to name the kid as a protected party. You know, I always think about Lee Salisbury, about my age, he probably could go with this, but you know, that old grandfather that used to come around and want to shake your hand and grandpa, let go, or pinch on the cheek, you know, you know, or throwing you up in the air and won't let you go, you know, and stuff. I never perceived that as playing, by the way, you know, so. Maybe I should have called the DCFS way back when. <laughs> okay, the case demonstrated that children can't be called as witnesses in restraining order cases. I get a lot of pushback when I say, yeah, I'm gonna call the kids, you know, and if they're precipient witnesses or they're victims, they're gonna take the stand. And of course, the court's gonna protect them as much as possible. We've seen them bring the kids into chambers and things of that nature. So, and I think most importantly, the standard is simply good cause, okay. Let's turn to now the bulk of our, de our decisions today. We're going to be talking about marital agreements. And there's uh, four decisions here. I think there were four. And these are significant in my view. Okay, uh, Broken promises, I'll call them that. Let's turn to page 59. And we're talking about the estate of escrow. And this is a case of mistakes. What happens when somebody signs something and they're mistaken? In May of 2015, the parties marry. At the time of the marriage, husband has a minor daughter from a previous relationship. Shortly before the wedding, wife learns that husband wants a premarital agreement in which the parties will waive their interest in separate property. Wife reviews the proposed premarital agreement and learns the agreement contains provisions relating to the applicability of the waiver in the event of death and not just divorce. And she sends an email, or she talks to her own attorney, by, by the way, and says, look, I didn't agree with this. You know, uh, you know, I do something about this. You know, I'd, I'm okay with it if we divorce, but not in the, in the event of death. So wife's attorney sends an email to the husband's attorney objecting to the premarital agreement portion protecting the separate property in the event of the death and the waiver of spousal support interest. Now, what happens is there's a misreading of the premarital agreement by the, by the wife's attorney. And basically she objects to the beginning clauses on the premarital agreement, but she doesn't look at the entire agreement. Uh, and so what the husband's attorney does, he speaks to the husband and he says, uh, what do you think? Is this something, you know, and you know, 
uh, they're saying that they didn't want this. He goes, no, I intend this. I want my kids to have, have my estate in case I die. He goes, and I don't want you to go back and forth with her. You know, and with this other attorney, and I don't want you to educate her as what she's missed because she's just talking about that first portion. You know, you can take that out, but leave the rest of it in. And that's what he does. Um, so what happens after that is the wife's attorney sets aside an entire day and says, come by any time that you want. Your wedding is coming up. Come on over. We're going to go over it. And she later testifies that she was going to excise out or demand that things be removed uh, that were in there. Well, wife decides she doesn't want to pay the $300 to meet with her attorney, right? So she goes to the husband's attorney by herself, unrepresented, and less than five minutes of looking at the document, signs it. And then later on, of course, uh, husband dies, sadly, right? And he dies intestate, which I think is important in this case. And I'll, you know, we'll talk to, to Allie about this. So wife petitions to be appointed personal representative to administer her estate. Husband's ex-wife files an objection to the petition on behalf of her daughter. And husband's parents file a competing petition for appointment as personal representative. So you've got these family members coming out and saying, oh, whoa. Well, the probate court uh, favors the husband's family with respect to this. And remember, now, unlike that last case, we're in probate court dealing with family law issues, aren't we? Trial court grants the grandparents' motion to exclude extrinsic evidence concerning the premarital agreement. Goes up on appeal. The court of appeal says no. In probate court matters, unlike in family court matters, we look at extrinsic evidence. You could, you, we could look at that, so it sends it back. What happens then is on remand, the trial court limits the scope to considering wife's theory of unilateral or mutual mistake. So the trial court says, okay, well, I've got this back, and we're going to look at, was this unilateral or mutual? Several witnesses testify that husband intended his property to go to his daughter. Wife testifies husband never told her that he intended the PMA to apply in the event of a death. And, of course, her mother testifies the husband says, you know what, if anything ever happens to me, you'll be taken care of. Trial court finds that husband knew wife did not want the premarital agreement, so she starts making findings. Yeah, I believe. I believe that the husband knew that in the event of death, and the wife thought that the premarital agreement applied only in the event of birth. I think she was mistaken. I think that she thought that it was excised out. So we got him knowing that she was mistaken, without a doubt. However, it was wife's unilateral mistake, uh, and for that reason, it does not justify a rescission of the agreement, because husband uh, had not encouraged or fostered her into making the mistaken uh, belief. She bore the uh, risk of her own mistake. She did not act with reasonable care when she failed to read the agreement. Trial court finds that the mutual mistake does not apply because husband was not mistaken. So if you look at the decision, if it was a mutual, if it was a mutual mistake between the two of them, that would have been different, okay? But when it was a unilateral, it wasn't, okay. So takes it up on appeal and the court is affirmed. The trial court did not err in denying the rescission of the agreement. Um, and, you know, I don't have to belabor the point because it, it's pretty clear if, if you look at the decisions that they cite uh, that the trial court was, was correct in this, in this way. Uh, the case is meaningful not so much because of the mistake analysis, but how the terms of the premarital agreement affected what later happened in probate court. Many of us have been under the apparent false impression that marital agreements have no place in probate court. You know, if somebody dies, the marriage is still intact, you know, we we'll deal with probate court with the probate code and so on and so forth. Well, that's not the truth. So whose eyes should we be viewing this decision from? And I would say that when you read this decision, look at it through the wife's attorney because she's the one that's going to have to pay possibly for malpractice, right? Uh, there was inconsistent testimony about uh, what had happened between her and her own client. We see that wife's attorney did not read or fully understand the provisions of the agreement. It seems like the husband's attorney was very persuasive in this case which tells you that we should be documenting very closely what's occurring because as we see in other cases, people come back you know, 20 years later and you're on the stand and you're like, and what happened? I don't even remember this client, to be honest with you. Is that my signature? You know? So how important is good note-taking? It's very important. What do you do when a client refuses to come in and meet with you to review important documents, like a premarital agreement? Do you say, yeah, I'll sign it when you come back? I don't think that I would. By the way, I didn't say this, but this premarital agreement was signed the day before the wedding. 
And we know now that because of the revision of the law, that's not likely to happen anymore, right? Because you got that cooling off period. Okay. Uh, and one final note, and Ali, I want you to think about this. He died in test state, right? What would have happened had he had a trust instrument or a will? We probably would have saved the family a lot of problems, right? And that's why when we do premarital agreements, we should always strongly advise our clients to also have a will or something like that, you know, because they cover different things, and they protect people even better. Okay. Now let's talk about Randall versus Farmer's New Life Insurance Company on slide 71. So we're going to be dealing with an insurance policy that's part of a marital settlement agreement. In 1992, wife and husband procure a life insurance policy insuring the husband's life. Wife is the sole beneficiary, and there's a $250,000 death benefit. The policy is through Farmer's and obtained by an insurance broker by the name of Hebson. That's important. Hebson's name, you, you would see is very important to this decision. In 2004, they divorce, and they have a stipulated judgment of dissolution that provides that wife has a one-fourth beneficial interest in the life insurance policy. Husband is to maintain the policy and is free to name any beneficiaries as to the remaining three-quarters interest. Very odd. I've, I've never seen this before. Here's the provision. This is the additional provision. If husband decides to discontinue paying the premium of his three-quarters interest, then he shall forfeit his ownership as to his three-quarters interest. He shall notify wife in writing and assign the policy to wife if she chooses to pay the premiums. If wife should not so choose, then the policy will lapse. If wife does choose to accept the three-quarters interest, then wife shall be free to name any beneficiary she chooses. Well, 2006, husband submits a request to change the beneficiaries because they got kids and he wants to name them, right? The request of change purports to add the couple's three sons and states that the wife and the couple's three sons would each be a 25% beneficiary interest. However, he doesn't follow the policy provisions on how to do this. He does not register these changes because its uh, procedures require a complete copy of the divorce decree. So the, the farmer's insurance says, well, we're not allowing you to register because you just had the provisions about this, uh, about this asset. You're supposed to uh, register the entire uh, marital settlement agreement. In 2008, husband informs wife that he's no longer paying the premiums and the policy is about to lapse. So he says, it's yours now. Go ahead and take it over. So she gets in communications with this Hepson fe fellow. He's the broker of the insurance thing, and he's a nice guy. And he says, you know what? Uh, just keep paying the premiums. We'll keep record of that, and I'll make sure that you get what you want should he predecease you. So she starts making the payments, and she pays it for a long period of time until her former husband dies in April of 2014. Days later, she submits a claim for 100% of the policy benefits. And uh, the defendant, which is gonna be Farmers Insurance, informs her for the first time that there's a dispute over whether or not she's the sole beneficiary because the kids are coming back into the picture now and they're saying, wait a minute, we're supposed to be 25%, right? The beneficiaries is in dispute and the request was not accepted or registered because, and, and here's what the, the farmer's insurance says. It says, look, you know, your former husband didn't follow the policy. He didn't follow procedures according to what they're supposed to do. So we're not allowing you to register it. Uh, Hebson then jumps in on behalf of the of wife. He says, wait a minute, that's not right. Uh, they had an agreement and she's been making the payments all along. So he's advocating for her. And farmer's insurance says, talk to the hand. Uh, and finally, it says, you know what? If you guys keep fighting, I'm going to interplead the funds. How do you like that? Well, somebody got a hold of farmer's insurance. So on August of 2014, the defendant pays the policy proceeds to the wife and her three sons per the 2006 request for a change of beneficiary. So he just gives in and just pays all the proceeds to the kids. Well, wife files suit against breach of con sues farmer's insurance for breach of contract. Defendant files a motion for summary judgment arguing wife was not the owner of the policy because, because husband did not follow the policy's procedures for changing policy and therefore there could not be a breach of contract. Wife appeals and it's reversed. In overturning the trial court's decision, the Court of Appeals cited Morrison versus Mutual Life Insurance and basically stated that the legal principle to be applied is this. Once the true ownership of the policy is brought home to the insurance company, whether that ownership is established by taking out the policy in the name of the owner or by assignment or by contract or gift, 
the company is bound to recognize the rights of the lawful owner. The question is whether at the time the company paid the proceeds to the insured, it had such knowledge or notice of the plaintiff's ownership. And in this case, it did, didn't it? Because she submitted the uh, divorce decree promptly to Farmers Insurance, but they went ahead and paid the kids anyways. So what do we learn from this case? I think we learn a lot here. It's, it's very interesting to me. Uh, one of them is, is how a marital contract has meaning in probate court, okay? Uh, you know, we think that these things don't, but they do. Um, you know, the probate court was looking at it and, and went along with it. If your client enters into an agreement for life insurance provisions, tell them what is expected in the future. And I think this is the biggest tip that I get from it is if I ever do something like this, I'm going to have a CYA letter to the client saying, okay, per the terms of our agreement, and what you're supposed to do is register the judgment and make sure that the farmer's insurance has no way that they could say they didn't have notice because had she not done that, then they would have been successful in their motion for summary judgment. Okay, the next case we're going to talk about is on slide 83, and it's Welch v. Welch, and we're talking about death during divorce proceedings. So that was, you know, a post-divorce uh, death, right? Now we're talking about what happens when you die during divorce proceedings. It's a 36-year marriage. There's two adult children from the marriage. In September 2015, husband files for dissolution. In October 2017, the parties participate in mediation and execute a five-page mediation settlement agreement, dividing up their property and addressing other financial issues. The MSA is signed by both parties and their attorneys. The MSA states, we have read the entire stipulation and agreement. We understand it's fully requested the court to make it. So they're, they're saying this is going to be you know, incorporated into the judgment, pursuant to 664.6. Husband drafts a proposed formal judgment providing for the dissolution to be, proceed as an uncontested matter. And the wife starts objecting. She says, you know what, um, I don't think that you're accurately, accurately reflecting the terms of the MSA. You know, you're, you're throwing some extras in there, and I don't like that. And we all have dealt with this a gazillion times, right? In January 2018, he files, the husband files a request to enforce the settlement and enter judgment pursuant to 664.6. And the wife files an opposition to the motion to enforce. So they're in the middle of litigation on this, and the hearing is continued to June 25th of 2018, but on June 16th, wife sadly dies. Okay? So the husband is the one that has been pushing for the enforcement of the judgment that his attorney prepared. He says, this is what I want. This is what we agreed to. By the way, it might have some extras in it. Okay? But this is what I want. And the trial court signs the proposed judgment, dissolving the party's marriage and distributing the property, not knowing at that time that wife had died. So in October of 2018, husband looks at this, he talks to his attorney, he realizes, I would have been better off without this judgment. I don't want that anymore. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait judge. So he moves to set aside the judgment, and the court grants his motion. Now, child one, acting as the proposed administrator of wife's estate, opposes the motion, but the trial court rules the judgment was entered, is void, vacated because the wife had died, and so we're back to square one. Well, the child appeals, but the family court's order setting aside the dissolution is upheld on appeal. Uh, in February 2019, the probate court child files a petition for letters of administration and was appointed special administrator. Uh, in April of 2019, the child files uh, probate code section 850, and this is like foreign language to me, so I'm not going to get into it. Um, but what he does, though, is he opposes, husband opposes the, the child's petitions and files a petition for probate of wife's pour over will. Well, the trial court denies the child's petition for recovery of the uh, property under the probate code, and the child and the wife's sister appeal. And this is actually reversed. And this is what happens during the appellate court ruling. The issue before the Court of Appeal was whether by entering the MSA, the husband waived his rights of surviving spouse enumerated in Section 141. And first the court looked at the relevant law, which is found under Probate Code Section 142. And without belaboring the point, again, just look at the code section. When this happens, it doesn't matter that there was a judgment of dissolution that was entered or not. It was the marital settlement agreement that is enforceable in probate court so long as two things happen, right? One of them is there's a complete agreement, and two is that there was complete disclosure. Sounds a lot like a premarital agreement or something like that, right? 
Well, husband on appeal says, yeah, but there were some things that she didn't uh, uh, reveal. The parties didn't disclose everything, right? So it wasn't, and the, and the court said, well, look, uh, this was substantial enough. You know, we, we're not going to look at every pot and pan that you're talking about. Um, the other objection was there was litigation. That wasn't a perfect agreement. They were a disagreement. And the court said, you know what? That's what happens with contracts. Contracts were meant to be broken, right? And not every contract is, is perfect. Uh, we're going to uphold this. So what do I learn from this case is despite the death of a spouse during the pendency of a divorce, the financial provisions of their MSA may be enforceable, right? Thus, in certain cases, it may be good to get a settlement out ASAP, even uh, in terms where the judgment is going to take a lot longer. You know, and I think that many of us have had cases where we've got clients that are dying. You know, I've had, uh, it was my very first client uh, when I started my practice, 76-year-old woman, she died within a year. You know, it's just a good idea to see if you get into a settlement conference and try to hammer something out, you know, so I'd be pushing for that. Okay, we're going to talk about nullity of marriage. And the two cases we're going to talk about are more entertainment than anything else. They're putative spouse cases. And the first is marriage of Abulus versus Volvovic, um, and that's on slide 99. Uh, wife files a petition for divorce in October of 2006 and believes she will be divorced from her former husband automatically within six months. Now, how many times have you heard that, right? A client, these people come in, they go, hey, I read on the internet, my friends are telling me that divorce is gonna be done in six months, right? <laughs> no, okay, okay. So she thinks she's divorced, and in March of 2011, she marries husband number two. In May of 20, uh, 2011, just two months later, she appears in pro per in child support court related to her prior marriage and learns by the judge who says, uh, ma'am, by the way, uh, you're not divorced. What? <laughs> so she finally gets her divorce finalized uh, in March of 2012, and then her and her husband number two start getting married in these ceremonies, right? In April of 2013, wife and husband, number two, go through a second marriage ceremony through a Catholic church where they receive the marriage certificate through the church rather than through the county. Uh, no licenses done at that point because they already have a license, right? In, in September 2013, the parties go through a third marriage ceremony where they do not receive a marriage certificate. Now in January 2020, husband number two calls it quits. He files for dissolution. In April, husband two learns for the first time, supposedly, that wife was still married when she first married him. In August 2020, husband files, or I'm sorry, wife files an, a request for spousal support and attorney's fees. And it's, by the way, she's granted uh, temporary spousal support. 11-20, uh, husband files an amended petition for an annulment. Husband's responsive declaration to the request for spousal support is she's not entitled to spousal support. She was, she was still married when she purported to marry me. Wife does not qualify as a putative spouse because of the fact that she obtained a judgment of dissolution uh, from her former husband after her wedding to the husband demonstrates that she knew she was not married. Why did she go through all these ceremonies with me you know, unless she already knew? Husband, too, also argues that wife fraudulently induced him to take part in the second and third marriage ceremonies by concealing the fact that she'd been married at the time of the original marriage. Well, the trial court finds that wife is at least a putative spouse and awards her spousal support and attorney's fees and husband number two appeals, arguing the wife is not a putative spouse. So on appeal, uh, and by the way, uh, the court is affirmed, and this was a little surprising to me, the court noted that the applicable law as it pertains to what qualifies as a putative spouse is that it's a subjective test. A putative spouse is one who believed in good faith that the marriage was valid. The good faith inquiry is a subjective one that focuses on the actual mind of the alleged putative spouse. So here you got what? A lady committing bigamy, right? <laughs> and she's getting paid for it, for crying out loud. I mean, <laughs> I'm nightmares over this case. Okay. Next, the court looked at the evidence and said, I was, a, you know, uh, she, the wife explained, I was pro per. I was under the impression that once I filed and waited six months that the divorce was done. I was unaware that I needed a lodge of judgment. Okay. Uh, so what did I learn from this case? How many times have I listened to prospective clients during consultation tell me what they believe the law to be regarding cooling off periods? We all know the lack of a valid marriage certificate creates problems, right? Uh, but what about a case like this? You know, there was a valid marriage certificate for husband number two. It's just that, you know, she was still married. 
This is the first time I've seen where the person who was responsible uh, for the bigamy in the, in, the, in the marriage get to claim that she's a putative spouse. So it was novel to me because all the other decisions I've ever read, it's the other way around, right? It's, the, it's usually the guy and the wife is asking for support and she's the putative spouse. The decision does not speak of the provision of the law that states that when a putative spouse learns of the fact the marriage is void but continues on with the marriage that what? They waive the, the argument, right? You know, and that's what happens in a lot of these cases where somebody can't argue putative spouse because they, you know, they, they continue on even after they know. And I don't know if that's what the trial court might have thought happened here. So one more case, okay? And this is going to be on uh, slide 107. It's marriage of Eli and Marchaud. Again, it's about a putative spouse. Slide 108. Husband marries wife two in Lebanon despite being legally married to another woman in California. So in Lebanon, which I didn't know, <laughs> you get to have as many wives as you want, and it's perfectly legal. Uh, in August of 2014, wife two files for a request for temporary spousal support, attorney's fees and costs, and temporary emergency orders against eviction. So what's interesting here is she doesn't file for dissolution of marriage or legal separation. She just goes into family court with a request for spousal support. Many of us didn't know that that was possible. And I thought it was worth pointing out. Um, she alleges that in May of 2014, husband abandoned her, had ceased cohabiting with her, and had not provided her with any support. Trial court hears evidence on the issue of awarding spousal support. So the parties disagree as to whether they were validly married in Lebanon and divorced. Husband argues that the parties were not married, but had entered into a temporary marriage contract in Lebanon. So he's saying, look, you know, we weren't even married, so this is ridiculous. Well, the trial court says, too bad. Based on the evidence presented, the Lebanese marriage was valid under Lebanese law. Okay, so you were married, sir, legally in Lebanon. So, yeah, well, who knows how many other wives she's got over there. In December of 2015, husband files a petition to nullify the Lebanese marriage based on bigamy, fraud, and force, and requests that the court find that the marriage was void or voidable. So he's like, hey, I am a bigamist, okay? This was an invalid marriage. You cannot enforce this. In uh, February of 2016, the trial court awards wife temporary spousal support and grants husband's request to bifurcate his petition to nullify the marriage. So now he says, you know what? If you're going to order spousal support, uh, I might as well you know, change this back into a divorce. Okay, that's fine. Well, there's a change of the guard. Judge Bennett now comes into the case in July because the other court was uh, too busy. He, he commences trials on the husband's petition for dissolution, and he says, you know, I am looking at this decision that was before me, and I see that the court said that that Lebanese marriage was valid. And I'm not going to disagree with that, but what do I do with California law against public policy of bigamous marriages? I just can't ignore that. So he actually instructs the husband. He says, hey, I know that you've kind of filed this petition. He says, I want you to file another one back into a null nullity of marriage. So he basically orders the guy to do that. He does, and then he hears, has a trial. At the hearing, Judge Singley considers only the issue of bigamy under Family Court Section 2201 and reserves the issue of whether wife was a putative spouse. He states, uh, again, that you know, the Lebanese marriage was valid under, under that law. I'm not going to disrupt that. But that doesn't mean that I have to find that it's valid under California law, and it's against public policy. And therefore, sorry, ma'am. Uh, I'm not going to continue with your spousal support. You don't have any rights in California court. You're done. Well, she appeals, and this is what she argues you know, on appeal. The fact that the parties pleading admitted that there was a marriage required a trial court to find that the Lebanese marriage was valid. She's saying, hey, their pleadings, both of our pleadings, admitted that it was valid in Lebanon. Uh, and a ruling that the Lebanese marriage was valid precluded a different judge from subsequently ruling the marriage was void. So that second judge had no business doing what he did is what her argument is, right? Well, Court of Appeal affirmed. And the court dealt with that issue preclusion, and it said, you know, that, does, that ruling does not violate the doctrine of issue preclusion or prohibition against one judge reconsidering the ruling of another judge because there was no previous ruling on the issue, the issue of the California uh, law on it. And basically, you know, without going into a lot of detail for the decision, it was a public policy decision. It said, you know, it, yeah, that first judge was right, but I'm right as well. So uh, she is not a putative spouse under California law. So here we see a rare situation where a spousal su support request is made without filing for divorce. I think that could be helpful for some of us. 
Uh, we also see a rare situation where the public policy of California trumped the fact that the Lebanese marriage was valid in Lebanon. And wife number two actually believed she was married. She had a good faith belief that she was validly, you know, that she was married, right? Now, I didn't talk about whether she thought she was uh, legal in California. Maybe you know, there was some evidence of that. But she believed that she was married in Lebanon, and in fact, she was. Uh, now, my final point on here, other than here we have another bigamous winning at trial again. The bad guy wins again. But if the husband had signed an affidavit of, of support, I wonder if, she, if uh, she would have been precluded from receiving money at that point, right? You know, these people come over with those affidavit of supports. I don't know. I have a feeling that he'd, he'd still have to pay under, under the federal law. Okay, that wraps up the appellate court decisions. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some, a couple of the codes that were changed this year. Uh, the most important one to me was slide 122 that deals with section 6344. So this code has been modified so that upon request and after notice and a hearing, a court must issue an order for the payment of attorney's fees and costs for a prevailing part petitioner. Okay, this section also has been amended to provide that the court may award attorney's fees and costs for a prevailing respondent, but only if the respondent establishes by preponderance of the evidence that the petition or request is frivolously or solely intended to abuse, abuse, intimidate, or cause unnecessary delay. So I, I kind of like this one because there are some close calls that we have. With We know that domestic violence occurred. right? We know that the that we should be going on behalf of a client, but we're gun shy. We're like, look, if you go forward, you know, you might end up having to pay his fees because a witness might not show up or something like that. So this is a, a good one where, you know, the other side, if, you, if they win, they've got to show that, you know, you were uh, proceeding, you know, to abuse, intimidate, or cause unnecessary delay, which is, I think, a hard one in most of these cases. And it says must, the court must, and it goes back to that attorney's fees issue that we saw at the beginning of this case about public policy. Elkins' decision, whether or not there should be reasonable promptness. You should be arguing that when you, when you have this. Okay. Um, let's turn to uh, 126. And that's a new code prohibits collection of coerced debt, which includes debt incurred by a victim of domestic abuse or elder abuse that was incurred as a result of duress, intimidation, threat, force, fraud, or undue influence. So, you know, what I've seen, because I, I happen to have been familiar with a case that involved one of the main legislators that keeps adding on statues for domestic violence, is, is that there's a movement saying that victims of domestic violence don't have a place to go. So they're trapped in their relationships. And so you see a series of these code sections that are trying to protect uh, the victim. And uh, it's gotten to the point where uh, they're they're trying to create things that, uh, to me, don't, I don't know how they're going to be interpreted. Okay. That's all I have for today. I thank you again for joining me. This was fun. Uh, let's try to do this again. Thank you, Dan.